This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. In other news, if you haven't heard already, I have a podcast with Hakim and Yugopnik. If you're interested in longer form, more casual socialist content, check out the deprogram by following the link below. This is Emmanuel Macron on the night of April 24th, 2022. He's at Paris's iconic Field of Mars, right in front of the even more iconic Eiffel Tower. The crowd gathered in front of him, chanting his name and waving flags, is on cloud nine, because not 30 minutes ago, the national broadcast announced that Macron had been re-elected to the French presidency for five more years. And even though he was always preferred to win, if you rewind the clock just two months back, things didn't look so good for the sitting president. Two months ago, the scandal since dubbed McKinseygate started making its way through the French press. If you've never heard of McKinseygate, don't worry. It's very simple, and we don't need to go back very far to understand it. In early March of 2022, the French Senate conducted an investigation into the finances of Macron's executive branch. They were looking for something fishy following leaks in the press about the government relying a bit too much on consultants, and lo and behold, they found what they were looking for. Right there in the budget of the Elysee, France's presidential palace, they found a nearly 1 billion euro bill from various consulting groups racked up in just one year. I don't need to tell you that 1 billion euros is a massive amount. Think of it like 1 billion dollars. Does that help? No? Alternatively, you can think of it as 200 times what the French government spent promoting equality between men and women. Anyway, the report found that one firm in particular, McKinsey & Company, seemed to be getting the lion's share of the presidential wallet, and may have been benefiting from favoritism. Furthermore, the Senate alleges that McKinsey's French branch hasn't paid a single cent in corporate taxes during the past 10 years, despite making a cool 330 million euros on French soil. First lucrative government funding, then missing taxes. The whole thing seemed a bit weird. As a 100% impartial journalist, I should tell you that McKinsey denies the tax avoidance allegations, so you can make of that whatever you want. In any case, that's not the point. Macron's been dragging this reputation of President of the Rich ever since he took office. And now, all of France just found out that he spent a Bezos-like amount of public money on a few private cabinets well known for their place in high society. What's more, these consulting firms were given big responsibilities, like orchestrating the national strategy on COVID vaccinations and setting climate change plans for the future. Not exactly a small ask for just a few private firms. If you're the guy in charge, you couldn't ask for worse timing for a scandal like this. With barely over a month until the first round of elections, Macron's response had to be immediate and authoritative. S'il y a des preuves de manipulation, que ça aille au pénal. Ensuite, moi je demande qu'on nous donne aussi de la profondeur. Comment depuis 15 ans, les contrats avec les consultants ont évolué Je suis pas persuadé Mais que les gouvernements. Je suis pas persuadé que sous ce quinquennat, il y a eu moins de contrats que sous certains autres. Y compris de cette Macron's position is clear. All of this is perfectly legal, and not just that, it's nothing special. After all, previous administrations used consultants too. Why should he be the one to deprive himself of that privilege The subtext here being that not only is this not a big deal, it's being made into one to try to make him lose the upcoming election. But as you might expect from this channel, not only is Macron's argument that, well, he did it too, pretty weak when you're trying not to look guilty, he's wrong. This is kind of a big deal. McKinseygate, and I hate that name by the way, can we just stop adding gate to scandals? McKinseygate highlighted something deeper within our society that extends far beyond the walls of the French presidential palace. Specifically, who are these people we call consultants, and why are they so influential? The place to start is to determine whether consultants are really that influential at all. And why not let them answer that question in a completely neutral way? For example, you probably know us for our work in strategy and finance. But what you may not know is that we're helping all industry sectors cut carbon emissions by half by 2030 and to reach net zero by 2050. We've completed more than 1,600 COVID-related projects in more than 60 countries, published 500 articles, and hosted 800 webinars to help safeguard lives and livelihoods, navigate the pandemic, and shape the next normal. Our purpose is to help create positive, enduring change in the world. I've emboldened our colleagues to be ambitious and find ways we can double our current rate of innovation. So That's a great video, but we have to pause here for a second. Double the innovation? That's gotta be at least like five times the creativity, right? Or like 
10 times the amount of disruptive, revolutionary paradigm shifts in equivalent units. How did they do that? Anyway, of course consulting companies are going to say they're influential. Otherwise, why would you hire them? But you might still want to, I don't know, not take everything consulting companies say at face value. After all, during McKinseygate, a lot of the discourse in France focused on the pointlessness of some of these expensive contracts. One contract in particular got a lot of press, a project by the Boston Consulting Group to organize a conference that never happened and never got rescheduled. Absolutely nothing happened, and it cost France over 500,000 euros. But that example, as ridiculous as it is, is more of a red herring than anything else. Consultants really did have a lot of influence in French politics for the past few years. Take housing assistance. In January of 2021, the French government announced it would reform its housing assistance program, supposedly in need of, quote, modernization. What did modernization look like? 30% of state fund recipients saw their assistance shrink. Another 6% got cut off entirely. Processing delays went from one month to three under the new, more technical system. In short, several hundred thousand French people in poverty were put into an even more difficult situation than they were in before. And behind it all, a four million euro check made out to the consulting cabinet's McKinsey and Company. But don't worry, thanks to McKinsey's advice, the state saved nearly four billion euros. Yay! How did they do it? By following McKinsey's incredible tip to cut off the poor and dump them on charity's lap. Truly revolutionary stuff. But that's not the only place where consulting cabinets were involved. According to the French Senate report, consulting cabinets were involved in most big reforms made by the Macron government. Consultants orchestrated the management of the COVID vaccination campaign, intervened in the reform of unemployment insurance, of vocational training, legal aid, and in the health system. Consulting services are used from the top of the government all the way down to road speed radars, which the state has deferred the responsibility of managing to Soprasteria and EGIS, two more consulting firms, at a cost of 82 million euros. When you take the time to look, it turns out you can find the fingerprints of this or that consulting firm at every level, down to even the most basic functions of the state. Still, you might be tempted to ask whether this is a problem. People are people. Somebody was going to have to take care of it. Why does it matter that it's consultants? And that's not a bad question. But the problem with all this is that consultants don't operate on the same incentives and logic as civil servants. Consulting firms, since they're private industries, operate on the logic of businesses and profit. The author, journalist, and, as it turns out, former McKinsey consultant Anand Giridharadas writes about the way consulting works in his book Winners Take All. Here he is describing how consulting firms present themselves and the messages that they communicate. McKinsey, like Goldman, had a persuasive story to tell. It was a place where you could change the world, improve lives, invent something new, solve a complex problem. But these firms were in fact channeling a widespread dogma of the market as the place for world changing and of market types as ideal world changers. Consulting firms exist to deliver a central message, that change is the exclusive domain of the private sector, that governments might have good intentions, but that markets are more effective, more efficient, and more capable of bringing about any desirable outcome, including social justice. This message that's at the core of consulting firms, and more broadly neoliberalism, suggests that governments should therefore try to act like the private sector to adopt its logic and its methods, or downright outsource responsibilities if they really want to make good on their promises. In other words, if they want to work, governments have to start acting like startups. And to do that, they have to hire consultants to show them how. The problem is that consulting firms don't typically end up delivering on the promise of efficient social justice for one key reason. Profit and social justice don't mix. According to consultants, you can always find a win-win solution that satisfies both the good thing you're trying to do and helps your bottom line. You can always do well by doing good. But the reality is, you can't. But consulting firms try to sell it like this. Capitalism is in crisis. People are wary of big business and blame it for the major social, economic, and environmental problems they face. Businesses are accused of profiting at the general public's expense, and the public's not wrong. But we, consultants, we can fix businesses and society at the same time. We can align businesses and their immediate goals of profit with social responsibility. Consulting can help get rid of outdated methods of value creation that hurt the image of the capitalist economy today. Basically, if you're a business owner, don't worry, the consultants are here and we're going to rehabilitate capitalism. 
And that's not me, JT from Second Thought, saying that. That's Michael Porter and Mark Kramer, two consulting firm founders writing in the Harvard Business Review. In practice, this works about as well as you can imagine. Consulting firms don't rehabilitate capitalism as much as they give it more room to breathe. When they work with governments, as in France, they are there to dismantle the state apparatus bit by bit. Make things like poverty the private sector's problem. Pawn people off on charity because when you want to run the government like a business, it's just good business sense to cut down on your expenses. But it doesn't end there. When they work with other private firms, consultants are there to serve as a tool for executives to wield against their workers, to formalize the power dynamics inherent to capitalism. Consultants, expensive, flashy, and well-regarded, pump out reports that outline how the best thing for a company to do, the most profitable thing, is to disregard workers and their demands for higher wages, better benefits, and work conditions. No, no, see, our report says the best thing to do is to make incremental reforms and make sure workers feel valued, without giving them a nickel more, of course. And hey, because they're experts and did the research, consultants are infinitely more legitimate than a handful of workers, coming up with ideas themselves, discussing them together, and uniting for better working conditions. That's not very scientific after all. And it turns out the science commissioned by your managers says capitalism was the best way to go all along. So we'll just listen to that and you can stop with all the unionizing stuff. If this sounds far-fetched to you, look no further than a McKinsey report from September 2021 published amid fears of the Great Resignation, in which the consulting firm alleges that employees crave investment in the human aspect of work. More than pay, benefits, or perks, workers want to, quote, feel valued. The report was accompanied by this chart, plotting the importance for employees of health and compensation, somewhat or less important, alongside their having a sense of belonging and feeling valued very important according to the report. These reports tell executives to quote, listen to their people. Just listen to your people, people. But never to the point of actually letting them decide anything themselves. And certainly not when their demands start getting in the way of your bottom line. And this isn't some cherry-picked example. Anti-union consulting is a rampant problem. Companies like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Ikea are hiring all sorts of consulting firms with less publicly recognized names to tamp down unions or any sort of labor power. A study by the Economic Policy Institute estimates that American employers spend roughly $340 million annually on union avoidance consultants, using a wide range of legal and illegal tactics to frustrate the rights of workers to form unions and collectively bargain in the process. And for good reason. A worker covered by a union contract earns 13.2% more than a peer with similar education, occupation, and experience in a non-unionized workplace in the same sector. Union workers are more likely to have employer-sponsored health insurance, and their employers contribute more towards these plans. They are also more likely to have paid vacation and sick leave. Union workers are more likely to have retirement plans, with their employers contributing more towards those plans than comparable non-union employers do. Unions also create safer workplaces. And union workers are covered by due process protections so that unlike non-union workers in the US, union workers cannot be fired at will, with no warning and for almost any reason. With all that in mind, it's easy to see the kind of capitalism consultants are trying to rehabilitate in their reports. A lot of people think consulting is a scam. Understandably so. But what is a scam? The Dictionary, my favorite book, says a fraudulent or deceptive act or operation. But you and I might just say a lie used to get something. For consulting to be a scam, then, it would mean that it doesn't deliver on its promises. That its promises are just lies used to get someone to pay for their services. So, you might ask, do consultants deliver on their promises? If their promises are to make the world better, to aid humanitarian causes, to improve people's lives, consulting is a scam. They might have shiny reports, awards, and fancy client lists that go on for pages, but their methods of capitalism first, social justice second, mean that all their projects are ultimately empty shells for promoting a neoliberal ideology. But social justice isn't really what consultants promise, at least not to the people that hire them. Those do-good promises, that's what they tell their employees and the general public. When they write up client contracts, the promise is very different. Consulting firms promise to further empower the rich and the powerful, to turn over democratic institutions to the market and its select few dominant actors, both in the workplace and at the national level. And when it comes to keeping that promise, consulting delivers. Consulting isn't a scam, it's the most honest business there is.
I mentioned at the beginning of this video that my content is made possible thanks to my patrons on Patreon. When I made the switch to political content, most of my sponsors bailed. Which is fine, I'd rather just have a few that genuinely care about my channel and its message. But that also means I'm having to rely much more heavily on viewers like you. If you enjoy the content I'm producing and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. You'll also get a bunch of cool perks if my undying love and appreciation isn't enough. Also, if you're looking for something to listen to at work or on your commute, make sure you check out The Deep Program. It's my podcast with Akeem and Ugopnik, and it's dedicated to helping listeners unlearn all the capitalist programming we've all been subjected to over the years. That, and it's just fun to hang out and talk commie stuff. The response has been great so far, and I really think you'll enjoy it. Links to both my Patreon and the podcast are in the description. That's all for today. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.